Uh, Matt Ellenwood. My name is Matt Ellenwood, and I work for the North Carolina Justice Center's Education and Law Project. Um, thank you, Representative Bryan and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak today, and I'll echo Representative Warren's comments about how it is a fair and balanced approach that you've taken in this committee. Um, we represent low-income and at-risk students and their families across the state who have educational issues. Um, so we really appreciate the focus of this bill, um, that it places it on underserved and low-performing schools. Um, clearly, a lot more needs to be done for these schools. Right now, I think only a small fraction of the 500 schools or more than 500 schools that have been identified as low-performing um, are receiving any kind of additional intervention in terms of resources. Um, it's less than one out of every five. Um, however, we're concerned that this bill uh, promotes an approach that, that doesn't provide these new resources in the classroom, at the classroom level, or classroom interventions um, to address the problems that these schools face. Um, we're also concerned that the ASD um, could exacerbate some of the problems with teacher staffing and, staff and turnover that have been mentioned and that's been well established in the educational research, especially in North Carolina. Um, and finally, we're concerned that the research to date on the ASDs is not pointing in a clear positive direction, um, not enough to justify the cost as we could see that the Tennessee program was supported by over uh, $500 million in, in federal race to the top funds and significant private investments that we don't have, we're, we not, don't necessarily have the benefit of that right now in North Carolina. Um, so we hope that other interventions will be considered for low-performing schools that have a stronger grounding in research and provide a, a greater return on the state's investment. Um, some of these include increased access to pre-kindergarten and early childhood education, reduced class sizes, access to experienced and highly qualified teachers, adequate textbooks, instructional supplies, and broadband access. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pamela Blizzard. I'm Pamela Blizzard. I'm here as one of the founders of Raleigh Charter High School and Research Triangle High School in Durham County. Um, our children's education has been a passion of mine for almost 20 years now. And I, I'm here to ask you to consider supporting a pilot of an extremely well-designed Achievement School District program in North Carolina. Um, I also want to say thank you to Drs. Henry and Glazer. My notes started out looking like this, and if you can see all the red, that looks like, um, my notes are about 90 seconds long now. Um, I want to state that I think if solid, experienced, well-grounded charter schools can give at least five of those over 400 low-performing schools in our state the help that they need to best serve our children, I, I think that that's something strongly to consider. Um, when we opened our school in, in Durham County four years ago, a student was debating whether to stay with us after the first year because it was so hard. And I, I pulled up the DPI's website and I showed him the school that he was considering going to, his base school. 7% of the students were proficient at that school. And at our school immediately in the first year, 42% of the students were proficient, which is still not good enough, but a pretty strong comparison. Um, we have schools in this state that are so low performing that it's almost um, uh, criminally negligent. Um, charter operators that specialize in meeting the needs of students in, in poverty, living in poverty, who are attending low performing schools would love to be able to take on this challenge. Um, this year and in the future, the students in these schools need that incredible expertise that, that charter operators who are incredibly experienced at doing this could provide. And no child should have to wait year after year after year while programs are slowly rolled out to first one district and then another across the state. Um, rather than skipping a potentially successful program before it even has a chance to begin, I ask that you tailor North Carolina's ASD program to tackle some of these successes that we've heard about today and have learned from, from other states' programs. We could easily, maybe not easily, we could begin to design the best ASD program in the nation that could help the most schools and children who are in profound, distressing educational need. I appreciate your time and willingness to listen, and I hope that you will support this program as it get, begins to evolve through the legislative process. Thank you. Uh, Bruce. Good 
morning. Bruce Noldorf with the North Carolina School Boards Association. Unfortunately, I did not come with any notes, so I am kind of all over the place this morning, so bear with me. Um, First of all, I would like to thank the committee, Representative Bryan, for giving us the opportunity this morning to uh, discuss this issue, share some of our comments. We very strongly agree that a more aggressive approach on improving student outcomes and dealing with these low-performing schools is absolutely necessary. I mean, this is priority number one. And we appreciate Representative Bryan's efforts on this bill. I think you heard him mention there have been so far more than 50 versions of the bill. So, you know, he's been uh, flexible in making changes. And I also want to uh, commend the committee and their commitment uh, towards this issue. Uh, so far in the meetings, there have been good questions, good dialogue, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, one, one thing I want to mention is that when you hear charter school, you think school choice. And I just want to make sure everyone understands, this is not a bill about choice. This has nothing to do with school choice. In fact, the initial, uh, the first superintendent for the ASD uh, in Tennessee, he was Chris Barbic, a very uh, successful uh, charter school operator from Tennessee, uh, from Texas, who dealt with uh, low-income students. They recruited him to Tennessee to, uh, to run the Achievement School District. And Dr. Henry hit on this earlier, but I just want to quote Chris Barbic. And what he said after some time in Tennessee with the ASD, achieving results in neighborhood schools is harder than in a choice environment. I think that the depth of the generational poverty and what our kids bring into school every day makes it even harder than we initially expected. We underestimated that. So, you know, when we talk about charters and CMOs, starting one is very different than taking one over. And I think we've seen in Tennessee, when you look at the results based on the presentations earlier, the results ha haven't proven <coughs> that they're working. And just because they may have been in a city, and one of the things that we're looking for, one of the criteria is that a charter school has to be in that city or in that state and they have to have proven results. It's a very different student population. And I just think that we need to take that into consideration. I also believe that as we move forward, it is critical to involve stakeholders in this process, whether it be school boards, superintendents, just take another 30 seconds. Or maybe a minute. A minute. Yeah. Thank you. You know, we're superintendents to this issue. Um, we have provided feedback to Representative Bryan. Uh, we would like to sit down with him and discuss this with committee members on, on solutions. Um, but we have provided each of you a, seven, a list of seven pages of really legal concerns, pitfalls that we see that if not addressed um, will present legal issues and potential lawsuits and they really need clarification in moving forward. For instance, uh, Representative Horn talk, asked about facility and capital expenditures, and I think the, the woman from Tennessee said that they've kind of split that. Well, in this bill, it basically says that the, school, the local school boards are responsible for, and if I could just, uh, I know this, it says, quote, the local Board of Education shall be responsible for facility and capital expenditures at the qualifying school. And that includes routine maintenance and repair and capital expenditures, including building repair maintenance, so on and so forth. But as you know, there's very little money out there that districts currently have for this stuff. And so I think it's important that uh, we really take a look at that issue. And one of the points that we raise is when you talk about that, who determines what repairs, maintenance is required, and, and what priority, and what amount paid for those expenditures is appropriate? Who's liable for these maintenance employees, including for injuries and workers' compensation? I mean, these are just some of the issues that we've raised. Talk about transportation. The bill says 
that the local boards of transportation, the local boards of education, shall provide transportation of all students assigned to the achievement school in the same manner as provided for other schools. But we've heard that the day, the hours are different. Yeah. You know, so how can a district be held responsible for that transportation if they go to school on Saturday? If they get out at five o'clock? If they have different vacation times? How is that going to work? And, and these are issues that we've raised that are just not alluded to. And yes, you have your memorandum of understanding, but at that point, it's kind of up in the air. So I just want to, and we've heard about the rural issues. Um, because time is running out, um, lastly, I just want to point out that we talk about higher expectations, and I think that's critical. But I'm not sure, I don't believe this bill does that. When we talk about the success of the achievement school operators or the ASD, we're comparing them to the average of other qualifying schools, of the other schools in the bottom 5%. And I think they deserve better. I mean, I don't think that is success. And so while we are now on version 51, I think there are still tons of unanswered questions. It needs more discussion, it needs to be addressed, and uh, like I said, we're eager to work with you, but I still believe there's a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, uh, we've got um, my good friend, um, which will be our last public comment for the day, and we'll have a little conversation here. Um, my good friend, former representative Marcus Brandon. And Marcus, you can come all the way up to the front if you want. I know you might feel like you're left out from being used to being up here before, so wherever you're more comfortable with. I'll just go right here. How about that? Because I'm not going to take up too much of your time because I know I've been here before and I know it's 12 o'clock and I know what that means. And so, but, uh, it's, and so I will be respectful. I'm not going to take 10 minutes. It'll probably be about three or four minutes. But I did want to come and let you know that uh, if, for those of you who don't know, I am Marcus Brandon. I am now the executive director of Carolina Can. Thank you, uh, Rob, and to the committee for your diligence on this issue. Um, and it's a very important issue. Um, Carolina CAN stands for Campaign Achievement Now. We are a public uh, policy and advocacy organization that, that deals with um, education and um, disparities. And, and, and we want to make sure that all of our children have a high quality education, regardless of their zip code. That's our mission and that's what we do. But um, I'm here to today to talk about um, achievement school districts. And you guys know my story. And you know um, uh, as long as I've been here. and um, uh, for my entire life, I've had fault for kids that are communities that are in what we're talking about right here today. And, when we're, and ultimately, what we're talking about is accountability, the ultimate accountability. Um, when we're talking about people not graduating ready and not having the skills and they're not ready to learn, we know that it's not just about economics and what we see on television. I can let you know that these are dreams that are lost and talent that is not fulfilled and, de and communities that are devastated. And that's the reason why I started this work is because I realized that, you know, it wasn't just one or two kids that were having a problem, it was entire communities. And when you look at that, how long we've been kicking this can down the road, 30, 40, 50 years, then you will see devastation beyond that. So we as legislators and as policymakers, we have a responsibility to make sure that we do not continue to allow folks to fail kids for 30, 40 straight consecutive years. That is a responsibility. And just because we have accountability doesn't mean that people are being held accountable. I also am on the board of a charter school. And if we do not meet our metrics and if we do not do what the state asks us to do, they will shut us down and they should shut us down. But I will also let you know that the school directly across the street from me will have 700 kids go directly back in that school next August. They have been failing for 27 straight years. And that is 0% accountability. Not one iota of accountability. And so this is what this bill is talking about. It's ultimately, we're talking about accountability. And we know that it works. I disagree with some of the folks that came up and said, but we do know that these the, the achievement school districts work. That we don't know all of the grand things that have worked, but we know that it does work. We know that in Tennessee, that, um, we, that students in the first school year of the turnaround, they made gains in every single subject. 
and include double digit growth in algebra and English. That is gains. And so between 2008 and 2014 in New Orleans, they've lowered the proficiency gap by more than 20 points compared to the rest of the state. We know that. But the biggest number that I, uh, that I thought that was, um, was critical was 83%, this is a big number, 83% of parents in Tennessee were happy with their school. And I, I just read a, a statistic here in North Carolina where only about 15 to 17% of the parents are happy with their current school. So that's a big number to me that tells me that some people are doing some things right in terms of making sure we do the most important thing and that's state community can engagement, which is some of the things that we learned. We learned valuable lessons from what Tennessee did. We learned a valuable lessons from what Louisiana was able to do. And we can actually be able to implement those things here. But one of the things that we know what we have to do, and one of the things that I'm here to talk about is buying from the communities. It is not necessarily just, you know, exactly what the speaker before me said uh, was talking about, you know, how they perceive it. But you need to go in and you need to make sure that you have that clergy involved and that, and, and, and that you have those school leaders involved. And I would even go farther to say that as we consider this bill, that we might need to consider <coughs> to make sure that there are panels and there are on some of these, um, the, the, some in the bill that we have some of these panels and some of these folks that are making decisions, making some groups, that you want to have community folks in that. So you can and have the community empowerment. The other thing that I think is very important is wraparound services. And I can let you know because I still live in a very impoverished neighborhood and I choose to live there, but I but it's because I have to figure out how we're going to represent that. But what we will I will tell you that is that our education numbers are directly tied to poverty. We all know that. We can make all the policies we want and we can do all of the bills that we can make, but if we're not dealing with why kids are not coming to school ready to learn, if we're not dealing with mama in jail and daddy on crack, if we're not dealing with teenage pregnancy, we're not dealing with HIV AIDS, if we're not dealing with all of these things that these kids come to the school desk with, then we're not really doing anything. So any ASD bill talking about wraparound services is the, probably one of the most critical keys about how we're gonna be able to make sure that that child comes in at 8.30 ready to go. And that's a lot of different things. That's a lot of different things. But I also believe that in this capacity, those are the ways that those can be met. The traditional schools have failed to be able to do that because it's not their role. And and and, and, and quite frankly, it's very difficult to be able to do it in, in, in the setting that they have. The, clo the school closes at three, I promise you my problems begin at three. And so I need buildings open. I need computer literacy classes. I need English as a second language classes. I need GED classes. I need that building to stay open well past three because my problems start happening at 4, 30, 5 o'clock when the kids get off the bus. And that's, what, that, and that's where the community starts life. So this is a community space. It's a community buying space. And um, it's where we can deal with those problems where, um, and this is what you see that they did differently in Louisiana than they did in Tennessee. It's a, did a much better job. But we also have a similar example in, in Charlotte with, um, with, our, our, with, um, with our Project Lift, where they did create a public-private partnership where they were dealing with, um, with, where they're dealing with wraparound services. We do see those numbers that are coming up. But the other thing I want to talk to you about is the political will. The reason why we're all sitting here is because we have lacked political will to do something about these kids. The reason why we have 40 years of this same exact number for 40 straight continuous years, and I'm giving the benefit of the doubt of 40 is probably longer than that. But every single thing that we have proposed, the naysayers will always come up with a reason not to do it, which is exactly the reason why we're sitting here today. The only way that you can get 600 schools to be in the lowest 5% of the state for 20 more years or so, it's because you don't have the political will. Everybody wants to kick the can down the road. Every idea that's proposed, you find 50 excuses not to do it instead of just doing it. This is an excellent opportunity to, to look at it from the, to the, the, from the last speaker, to look at this as a pilot program, but this is an excellent opportunity for this General Assembly to say, no longer well, the state of North Carolina accept <coughs> you failing kids for 20 straight years. We do have something in mechanism in place. We will implement it if you don't do your job, DPI. We will do it if you don't do your job, SBOE. We do have these mechanisms in place and we will implement it. And you watch 
school districts around the state do everything they can not to be a part of that. And that's a good thing. But if we don't have anything, we don't have a policy that says that we can continue to fail kids, they're gonna to continue to fail kids. We've got 50 years of examples. So I'm gonna finish my comments with this. Have the political will to make sure the state of North Carolina does not continue to let kids look like me dash their dreams, hopes, and talents. We can do better. We can do better. Thanks a lot.